Kellyanne is a design practitioner, author, and social researcher, originally from Oteroa. Kellyanne has worked in design-led social innovation for a decade, including as principal of participatory design at the Australian Centre for Social Innovation. Kellyanne leads service design in Australia's largest public pathology and forensic service, teaches design and supports individuals and organisations to develop an ethical and inclusive design practice. Read more at Beyond Sticky Notes. I just want to say as well that Kellyanne will be talking um, about Beyond Sticky Notes and um, I, I started reading it over the weekend and I, I highly recommend it. So um, go out and, and buy it and read it because um, there's so much food for thought and so much there to really push our practice and really get the better impact and outcomes. So over to you, Kellyanne. Thank you, Jack. It's such a, a deep honour as well to be among colleagues and friends. Um, I want to acknowledge that that my feet right now are on Wangal country in, in West Sydney um, and certainly pay my respect to elders past, present and emerging. Um, I specifically want to acknowledge Dana as well um, for sharing your intergenerational resilience, um, your strength and your power. Um, thank you for sharing that with us. Um, Co-design is not an inherently good or an inherently decolonised discipline and I recognise that some work that has been done under the banner of co-design has been uh, colonising in its form. And whilst my feet are on Wangal country, my heart is at home on Te Kahui Maunga land uh, in Aotearoa and in my other home uh, on Cree Nation in Canada. Uh, like Morgan, I want to acknowledge that my practice didn't appear out of nowhere, but has been built upon, I guess, the practices of friends near and far, um, as well as a few movements like equity centred design and the design justice movement. Um, I also want to acknowledge that, of course, First Nations people have been designing, acting interdependently and innovating for thousands and thousands of years. And, you know, we have so much to learn and so much to be differential towards. So by way of positionality, um, I'm a white queer person. Um, I have a lot of like Morgan lived experience that I draw on in my work, um, in particular as an addict, a survivor and a foster parent. Um, you can find me at Kelly Anagram or Co-Design Club. Um, as Morgan, uh, as, as Jax has said, um, I recently wrote a book called Beyond Sticky Notes. I know that some of you have the book and I really thank you for buying it and supporting my work. And a few of the things I'll talk about today are, are from the book if you'd like to learn more. So I want to start by really acknowledging and busting a myth that we have, which is that people with less power have to make themselves heard. They do not. The truth of this is that people with more power, perhaps like me and maybe like you, have to create more safety, more generosity and more hospitality. And our systems need to be much better at listening to lived experience. People with lived experience do not need to change. So I think we, we all probably know about different styles of design. However, something that's problematic is we tend to use design phrases interchangeably as if they were the same things. Um, and they're not the same things, particularly not when it comes to power. Um, so I typically think about these across four levels. Designing at people, which is where the designer, the professional, the policymaker um, is the expert and they make decisions for people or at people. Um, the second one here is designing for people. So this one can seem like it's a good thing to do, like human-centered design, user-centered, patient-centered, whatever centered that you want to do. Um, the issue with this one is it's so easily corrupted. And often when we're running a something-centered process, um, what we're doing is listening to people. And we might listen really deeply. We might listen really, really widely, but we're not fundamentally changing the decision-making structures inside of our organisations. We can still get away with doing whatever we want um, and not having to change our power or give up any power because we're sort of listening. And what often happens because this one is so corruptible that we listen to people really well in the early stages of design and maybe through testing, but then the voice of the system takes over because people with lived experience aren't in the room. So what I usually see when something says it's patient-centered or human-centered is by the end, it's actually staff-centered um, in its implementation. 
I think we have lots of these things, designing at people and designing for people. And what bothers me is seeing things that are really human-centered or user-centered. We are seeing people as participants or passive, passive uh, recipients, and we're calling that co-design when it is not. When we start to move up to some of these layers, like designing with people in Planet, those are the things that are co-design, participatory design, deliberative democracy. And even further beyond that is led by people. So co-production, community-led design, um, citizen movements or design justice. And one of the things we can come to recognize how these design approaches are different are a couple of things. So what does it ask of us? Are we giving anything up? Um, who's making the decisions? Who's in control? And certainly often in a human-centered design process, the designer is still in control, the project team is still in control, the commissioner is still in control. Whereas when we're moving into co-design and co-production, we're starting to hand over, um, I guess, power and control to the people who will be actually impacted by the decisions, people who know and people who care. So instead of going into heaps of detail about what co-design is and is not, I typically think about this across three pillars. Um, and I think a lot of this, uh, I hope, sort of weaves in with some of the things that Morgan has shared and some of the things that Dana has shared. So first and foremost, co-design is a social movement. It's about transforming inequitable power structures. Second, co-design is a mindset or a way of being. And third, co-design is a method, it's design-led, it's participatory, creative, grounded in caring, power sharing and capability building. And if we only have one of these pillars, we're not doing co-design. But if we have all three of them, then we are. And the ones that are most often overlooked is the social movement side of things that Morgan and Dana spoke about so beautifully, but also the mindset, what is asked of us in terms of our ways of being. So if we zoom all the way out and have a little bit of a look at the system, we can see that at the most sort of macro level, there are a number of things that need a shift to permit and to promote co-design, to make it a norm to listen to and uh, be led by people with lived experience. And I think that it's really wonderful that we're all coming to this conversation as individuals who might be committed to power sharing, but it's not enough to expect individuals to share power. That has to be built into the, um, the very fabric and the connective tissue of systems and organisations. So some of the things we're wanting to move away from, of course, is making decisions for people. We want to move away from valuing professional expertise as the only kind of expertise that matters. Move away from seeing marginalised people as a burden or a problem, as Dana said. From systems that are colonising, heteronormative and ableist. We often hear that there's just no resources to make change, yet there's a whole bunch of lived people with lived experience who are sort of sitting on the bench and just not being tapped on the shoulder to come into the game. We tend to focus on consumer councils and committees um, and we tend to rush to solutions. Now what we want to do of course is to do with people to make decisions with and I, the way I sort of think about this is what if our systems weren't about delivering services to people but about learning with people. We need to, of course, value professional and lived experience equally, hand in hand, which sometimes might mean elevating lived experience and importance to recognise there's such an imbalance currently. We want to see people who are marginalised as resilient, creative and, and capable. We want, of course, compassionate systems that respond to dimensions of difference and don't try to homogenise people. And of course, there are not scarce resources. There is an abundance of experience. We're just looking in the wrong places. Do not make more councils or more advisory groups. We want to embed participation and lived experience leadership into everyday practice. And of course, we have to slow down to listen, listen, connect and learn. And what that asks of us is inside of our systems, shifting our governance models, creating new policy imperatives that encourage the things that are in the two column and sort of reinforce the importance uh, of getting rid of the things in the from column the from, from, from column. Uh, we want to have capability building for professionals, not expecting that they will just inherently know how to adopt these ways of being and doing, particularly if they are really stuck in that mindset of being the helper and someone has to therefore be helped. 
And of course, we have to adapt our commissioning and procurement models so that we're doing more co-commissioning and more co-procurement. And of course, monitoring, evaluation and learning as, as Dana suggested. So if we then zoom in, if we thought about the macro system and we want to have a look at the, the small circle of co-design, there's a few relationships that I like to think about in my practice. So some of those are the relationship between the convener of co-design and co-designers, the helper and the helped, and then between co-designers. And as I think both Morgan and Dana spoke about, we all exist at different positions on the matrix of domination. Um, and some of us exist fairly high up. Uh, we might be white, we might be men, we might be straight, um, we might be able. And that places us, uh, of course, in higher standing than those who exist um, in some of these dimensions on the outside of the circle. And what that means is there is an uneven distribution of power often between people who run co-design and people who are part of a co-design team. There is a massive power differential between people who are helping and those who are helped. And even between co-designers themselves, there's often a huge disconnect between people with lived experience who are high on the matrix of domination and those who are comparatively lower. And this is made much, much worse by the failing of commercial design methods to do anything helpful with this, to see and respond to trauma. Designers who have unchecked privilege or no concept that there are different um, positions that people inhabit on this matrix. And there's a massive lack of social theory in traditional design. So when I went to design school, uh, there was nothing about power or privilege. And I stepped um, forcefully into spaces where I never should have, um, where I didn't recognize any of the things that Dana spoke about or any of the things that Morgan spoke about. So the reason this all matters is when people have less power, particularly compared to positional power that professionals have, they can't take part in equal ways or often at all. It's become a kind of fixation for me of thinking about where all the people go who can't participate in design. Um, and part of that fixation is also thinking about how many or more of those people would have been welcome in design had we thought more carefully about building the conditions for their participation. So most of the design models we see start with discovery. Um, design work does not start with discovery, particularly not co-design work. The very first stage is what I sort of talk about as building the conditions for participation. Really thinking about who people are, um, the types of strengths and capacities they bring, and what they need to be included and stay included. This is about, I think, what, what Morgan and Dana both spoke about is really, really slowing down. So one of the main models from Beyond Sticky Notes is this idea of having a model of care for co-design. So for those colleagues who work in health or social care, we have models of care for like just about everything. Um, if you're having a baby, if you've got a chronic illness, um, we've got a model of care for that. Uh, what we don't have a model of care for, which seems odd to me, is how we design with people how we get alongside them, how we affirm their identities, and make sure that they feel able to be included and stay included. So the model of care has two components. The first component is all the things that we do before togetherness. We don't just sort of rock up to a workshop and assume that everyone will be um, okay with that, but we do a number of things to, one, determine if we are the right people to be doing the work in the first place and if co-design is needed, to build a support team to look after co-designers, to build relationships with co-designers, and to widen inclusion and address barriers to participation all of that stuff before we get in the room together. This is a, a deeply, deeply relational process. Um, and I think Morgan gave some beautiful examples of that. So once we've done all of those things, and I am talking about this in a very high level way, um, the book has lots of information about each of these components, including stories about um, when these things have been implemented and when they weren't implemented often with quite dire consequences. This is all underpinned by having a series of frameworks that support, care for, and keep us all safe. So that, for example, is something like creating a duty of care to co-designers. 
thinking about how you'll manage serious, serious disclosure as and when they come up. Of course, we need frameworks for payment and attribution. And one of the things that I like to focus on in particular is creating a code of care amongst co-designers of how we will support each other, care for each other um, and our different identities. So once we are in a room together, um, there's a number of things that we should and need to be doing, which always starts with focusing on social connection. So we're not getting at the boardroom table and thrashing out the design activities, but we're coming to know and be connected to each other as people. And that means letting go of our professional titles, if we're professionals. It means letting go of having to stand up in front of everyone and say, I am so-and-so and I've got all these qualifications. Um, it means seeking ongoing feedback all the way through the through the co-design process. Uh, having courageous conversations when people harm each other in a co-design group so that in particular, we prioritise the safety of marginalised people over the comfort of privileged people. And then we think about how to support co-designers after co-design is finished. And maybe that's about them taking on a different kind of role or just about sort of softening the blow of something ending, which can be distressing for people who are isolated. And of course, through this, we're caring for each other. We're caring for ourselves. We're implementing some of the practices that Morgan mentioned that we can borrow from other fields around supervision, self care and care of each other. So I wanted to just talk very briefly about assess the fit, which is the, the first step of the co-design process. And I think this one um, really connects in with what Dana was speaking about at the very start, which is where we have a really sort of hard look at ourselves, um, but also think about what is already strong inside of a context or a community. And there are two parts to this assessment. The first part is really thinking about is co-design needed? What's already been done? Will this add value or fatigue? Will it increase dignity and power or will it reduce? And what is the context according to the people that actually live inside of it? How do they talk about their past, their present, their future? What's happening at the moment and is this the right time? And if we can sort of answer yes to all of these questions, that this work would add value to the lives of people with lived experience as defined by them, then we're saying, are we the right person? So there are lots of places that are not my place to stand. If I was invited by Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander colleagues to work alongside in a project, then certainly if I could and should do that, I would. But I wouldn't just step into a First Nations space and assume that my work was wanted or needed. Sometimes when we um, are brought on by, for example, a government agency, we forget that we have to recontract locally, that we can't just assume because someone in office thinks we're needed, that people in community also share that. And when we're asking whether I need to lead co-design, we're thinking about who we are in relationship to the people we might work with and who we would be together. We can think about how various people are sort of placed across the, the matrix of domination. And if you are a person that has significantly more power and privilege than the people you're aiming on working with, it may be that you're not the right person. It's often helpful to share some aspect of identity with the people that we want to work with. It adds, I think, a layer that it can be so much more affirming. Um, we also know things about each other rather than having to learn those sometimes painfully and in a way that hurts people. We want to think about if we're capable of earning trust, if we're trustworthy. Um, and only if we answer yes to these things do we do co-design. And I know this can be tricky when we have, for example, commercial imperatives and design agencies that perhaps push us to take on work that we shouldn't or um, a boss that really wants us to do work when we shouldn't. But part of this work is not only increasing our own power literacy, but increasing the power literacy of our peers. Um, if you'd like to use this tool, in a couple of days, it will become um, a Miro tool in the, I think it's called the Miroverse. So maybe I'll send Jax a link to that so that if you'd like to use this kind of co-design planning tool and use the assessment framework that, that you can do that online. So to wrap up, um, the model of care 
will soon, when I have the chance, become a set of cards. So if you'd like to use that set of cards, um, I might also send a, a link out to the community um, and really welcome any feedback that anyone has. I don't claim to, for this to all be finished. <laughs> um, and it's of course possible that I have blind spots that I'm not able to see. So always welcome feedback um, from other practitioners or, or people in community. Thank you so very much um, for having me, Jax, um, and really such a delight to speak with uh, Dana and Morgan and, and see lots of colleagues on the call. Um, I'll wrap up there.